You're watching This Week in Louisiana Politics with Fred Childers. Good Sunday morning to you. I'm Shannon Heck. Thanks for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Politics on your local election headquarters. As we prepare for the third week of the Louisiana legislative session, let's take a look back at some of the highlights of the second week. Billions of dollars in tax revenue were debated and the fight over how to address crime took center stage. One candidate for governor campaigns on overhauling the state's tax structure by eliminating the ta income tax. But the fight may already be over at the Capitol. Republican Richard Nelson's plan to repeal the income tax and the money would be offset by a combination of raising the state's sales tax and reducing the homestead exemption, among other moves. Nelson thinks this will help put Louisiana higher in the economic rankings and make it competitive to bring people to the state. It's going to take big things to get that back, to get those years back, to get to get that raise in income. But I think those big things are what we should be fighting for. Those big things are what we should be debating. And Some lawmakers are hesitant, even though they would support repealing the income tax. Some want to wait and see how 2021 tax reform measures look now that they're in effect. Nelson's bills have been shelved for the time being, and he isn't sure if or when they'll be taken back up. A bill cracking down on alleged slumlords advanced this week. New Orleans Democrat Mandy Landry's bill would create criminal penalties for landlords that have blight on their rental properties. The, bills allow, the bill allows for criminal proceedings to speed up rather than take years for appeals. She hopes this will get landlords to clean up blighted properties faster, and that bill now heads to the full house. After multiple drive-by shootings on Louisiana's interstates, a legislator is looking to up the penalties. New Orleans Democrat Jimmy Harris wants to increase the penalties from one to five years in prison to three to ten. Under the current law, the interstate did not qualify as a location the statute could apply. This bill would add it following several of those deadly interstate shootings. Talking with, uh, with some of the law enforcement and some of the judges, when they looked at the, the time on that particular crime and the seriousness you know, of that crime, they thought that the, the one to five wasn't enough. Senator Harris says that he does not want people in the city of New Orleans to live in fear of driving on the interstate after reports of so many shootings there. So far, there has not been any public opposition to the bill, which now heads to the full Senate for debate. And a committee has approved Ezekiel's law, clearing the way for a vote in the Senate as well. The bill was pro proposed by Senator Mike Facey, the state senator from Homa. It's named in memory of Ezekiel Harry. He was a two-year-old killed last July and stuffed into a trash can. The bill would create a new committee made up of law enforcement and the Department of Children and Family Services workers to coordinate efforts to prevent child abuse. And when an unarmed person breaks into a home, should it be considered a crime of violence? One lawmaker says yes. Republican State Representative Debbie Villayo filed the bill saying that she thinks breaking into a home is a violent act, even if a homeowner isn't physically harmed. She wants to change simple burglary of an inhabited dwelling to a crime of violence, removing the option of probation and changing the calculation of good behavior. Why should a home burglar benefit from extra good time or early parole eligibility simply because his victim wasn't home at the time of the crime? Opponents say there are already laws in place dealing with violent acts like invasion or aggravated burglary. They fear more simple crimes will have an impact on sentencing and options for people who are convicted. The bill advances to the full house. And after several high-speed chases left people dead and multiple injured in Louisiana, state lawmakers are looking to create a task force to make changes. In December last year, an Addis police officer reportedly ignored a red light and crashed his car right into a vehicle, killing two teenagers. This week, legislators debated on a resolution to create a task force that will study police high-speed pursuits. And the state legislature is working on bills that would impact parents. One seeks to help pregnant women with their medical costs, and another clears up the law to better protect survivors of assault. I caught up with the lawmakers carrying the legislation earlier this week. Take a look. 
There are two bills in the Civil Law Committee today that focus on parents. One has to do with reimbursing medical costs during pregnancy, and another looks to clarify the state's law when it comes to terminating parental rights. After Louisiana put in place its near total ban on abortion, one Republican lawmaker wants to help pregnant people get help with their medical bills. HB 5 would allow them to seek out-of-pocket expenses to be paid for by the other biological parent of the child. In light of the reversal of Roe v. Wade, and which was a, a good thing in my opinion, we now have to start looking to protect uh, mothers uh, and, and give them more rights. Those seeking the money will have two years after birth and have to prove paternity of the other person. Another bill by Representative Jason Hughes looks to clarify the right to terminate parental rights of rapists. Current law can allow rapists to still have parental rights even if the rape were proven. HB 298 would make it clear if the child is a result of rape that the parental rights should be terminated. For survivors that do become pregnant as a result of rape and do not want to place their child for adoption or even if they do, that they are not being forced to co-parent with their rapist. Both bills advanced without any objection and now head to the full house for more debate. At the Capitol for your local election headquarters, I'm Shannon Hecht. After the break, we will catch you up on the latest in the fight around carbon capture and who is pulling in money in the governor's race. This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back. A group of Louisiana residents made their stance against carbon capture public. They want its growth in Louisiana to end, but others say carbon capture is a job creator and it's needed for the state. Jessica Knox reports. Whereas the legislation that says no to CO2 pipelines and ensure our lives are not put at risk. Activists created signs and chanted, asking state legislators to stop capture pipelines from being built across the state. People who care about their lake, people who care about their property, people who want a brighter future for themselves. Activist Jane Patton claims that the pipelines will contribute to the climate crisis, ruin soil, and pose a danger to small towns in Louisiana. Very questionable, untested, um, and unproven technologies and injection wells in Louisiana, they are not making sure that the people have clean air, clean water, or safety. It's an environmentally friendly technology. Uh, with with minimal impact. That's Russell Richardson, who says carbon capture is a job creator. It actually creates jobs, construction jobs, and ongoing maintenance jobs for, for the pipelines and that technology process. Louisiana Mid-Continent Oil and Gas Association also released a statement saying, carbon capture and storage supports Americans' energy independence, helps to reduce air emissions, and put Louisiana at the forefront of what's next for the energy sectors. Jessica Knox, Fox 44 News. In his run for governor, crime in the capital city, New Orleans, and Shreveport are the main topic of a new campaign ad from Attorney General Jeff Landry. As he states, he will crack down heavily on crime in Louisiana. However, law enforcement leaders are pushing back, saying that they have seen a reduction in violent crime. Baton Rouge Police Chief Murphy Paul is disagreeing with the Attorney General as he believes they are reporting a 21% reduction in violent crimes. The crime was the number one issue on the voters' minds here in Louisiana. I don't need any more statistics other than that. Uh, that's real people seeing real things and having real crime affect them. 
The police chief says that they need to be more proactive in policing and try to prevent crimes before they happen. And the latest round of campaign finance reports were released this week, and it showed that Jeff Landry is still raking in the money for his campaign far above his opponents at this point in the race. Landry reported having $9 million on hand between his campaign fund and the groups that fundraise for him. Newcomer Stephen Wagisback reported $3.1 million just a month after getting into the race. Treasurer John Schroeder has $3.4 million. Independent Hunter Lundy has $1.8 million. Sharon Hewitt has 660,000 on hand, Sean Wilson has 545,000, and Richard Nelson reported 280,000 on hand. And in the race for treasurer, a new poll commissioned by the lieutenant governor revealed who was pulling ahead. Early announcer State Representative Scott McKnight comes out with 14% of the support. Former Congressman John Fleming has 8%. But Democrat Dustin Granger pulls far ahead with 29% of support. There's still 49% of people who are still undecided, so there's still time to win over more votes. The treasurer's seat is currently held by a Republican. Coming up, I sit down with State Representative John Stefanski, who has authored legislation to tackle the fentanyl crisis. And he is running a campaign for Attorney General. This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back to your local election headquarters. I'm joined by State Representative John Stefanski from Crowley. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Now, John, you are really tackling, tackling the fentanyl crisis that we're facing here in the state. I know in the Crowley, Lafayette area, it's a big issue. So can you first tell me a little bit about your two bills that you're carrying this year and what they aim to do? Yeah, so, you know, the first one, you know, so fentanyl, just in general, like you said, it, it's a huge crisis really throughout this country that's going on right now. Leading killer if you're 18 to 45 and so trying to find a solution of that you know what keeps coming up when I'm talking to, to not only former policymakers but law enforcement people in the criminal justice system is um, the similarities uh, with heroin and we used to have a bill on the books or rather a law on the books that will require life imprisonment if you dealt heroin and law enforcement really thought that ran it out of the state and so mine my, my bill what it would do is really mirror that if you're caught distributing or manufacturing more than 28 grams of fentanyl uh, uh, it would require a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. And, and the hope is that it sends that same type of chilling effect that we used to have with heroin and runs fentanyl out of the state. Because let's be honest, if you're dealing fentanyl, you intend to kill people. It's that deadly. Uh, and, and so I, I really think we should have a zero tolerance policy if you're, if you're selling this stuff and trying to kill our citizens. The second uh, bill dealing with fentanyl is, is attacking it from a civil liability standpoint. Um, we, we know where the illicit fentanyl is coming from. We know it's being manufactured in China. We know it's sent over to Mexico, and then they bring it in. I mean, we there's been articles written about it. There's been studies done on it. The federal government's gotten involved, and and trying to hold the big people who are bringing this into our country more liable uh, is something I'm looking at. You know, it it it. 
it's a long shot, but but at the end of the day, if we know what's going on, you know, to me, let's try to find a solution to hold those accountable who are who are basically sending this stuff into our country to kill our citizens. That's what they're doing. Right, and that civil side is for any damages that come. So obviously, say, you know, someone tragically passes away, would this be so the families of that person can get some of those damages of that lost person back? Absolutely, yeah. So it would be, it's a civil action, so we're, we are, we're talking about damages. We're, we're creating a new cause of action, which would be a tort in our law, and going after, uh, again, trying to find a civil remedy for the family members who have been hurt by this fentanyl. And, and look, in, in most cases, that means death. You know, and so, uh, you know, from those two things, it's it's my part as a policymaker to try to help this problem. It, it's not the solution. It's not going to solve all of our issues. It's a it's a multi-tiered effort. It's going to take to do this. A lot of it's education. A lot of a lot of it is letting people know that if you buy an illicit substance, there is a very good chance it has fentanyl in it. And if it has fentanyl in it, there's a very good chance you could die after you take it. And so that education aspect is huge as well. Mm -hmm. And is is this something uh, John is running for Attorney General, as we all know? So, can you tell us about how you hope to address this? And also, I know crime is kind of the key topic in this campaign. So, how would you address that as Attorney General? Yeah, so I think, you know, when we're looking at this state, uh, there's a lot of problems. It's no secret Louisiana has a tremendous amount of issues from infrastructure to education to everything else in between. But crime to me is crippling this state and if we don't get our crime under control and it's specifically our violent crime things like fentanyl that's killing people if we don't get some of these core issues under control um, we're not going to be able to improve those other areas and so for me every single office in this state from the legislature to all the others should be looking at how their their roles can help with the crime problem and the, and as attorney general my, that would be no different I would take a uh, frontline role of trying to help with the crime in this state and and so you know as I as I shift my mind into looking at that position you know I, I just want to get really really aggressive I want to support our sheriffs and our DAs around this state and then secondly I want to be there again on the front line Lines to be able to help with our crime situation, and really our violent crime situation as much as I can. And our current Attorney General really talks about DAs being really lax on criminals and letting them out and having bond and all these things where they go and commit more crimes while they're out. So is that the kind of thing that you're looking to tackle? How would you really uh, assist them or crack down specifically on crime in that position? Yeah, absolutely. So first I want to say I think the vast majority of DAs in this state do an excellent job uh, of assessing uh, you know the cases and making sure that they're trying to bring people to, uh, to justice really so I, I think they do a great job but there is a tremendous amount that office can do in a support role you know and now some in some areas that support may be hey look what help do you need f from from our expertise from a technological standpoint can we help you work up cases can we help you uh, can you give us cell phones that you need us to help produce case reports on uh, do you do you need us to help with uh, getting you into the right crime lab it's it's support like that but in some cases in some smaller jurisdictions it may be actually loaning assistant attorney generals to go help try those cases on the front line when the office has a better uh, more experience maybe in some cases and then other times it's 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 freeing up some of these offices it's handling appeals where they're getting bogged down in these appeals that are taking a long time so that they can direct their uh, assistant uh, district attorneys to be able to go prosecute more violent crimes and move cases faster we have a problem in this state and it's it's not unique to Louisiana but we have a problem with moving cases okay so when someone gets charged with a crime how long does it take for justice for those victims okay how long does it take before the, the uh, accused is actually brought to to trial. And so a huge part of, of, in my opinion, the AG's role is helping uh, district attorneys throughout this state expedite some of those processes and take on what burdens we can on a state level to help. Mm -hmm. And your opponent, Liz Morrell, she um, you know, came out with the most campaign funds, but we know there's still a lot of time in this race. And she's really focusing a lot of her campaign on protecting the freedoms of Louisianians. And she really highlights the cases that she helped 
uh, challenge the Biden administration. So do you feel that you would be able to, you know, first of all, take on a, a presidential administration for these things? And how do you really set yourself apart from her? Yeah, and so I, I would say first and foremost, uh, federal overreach is a tremendously important role of the Attorney General's office. And, and that is something that I'm going to be well equipped and well prepared to do. Um, what I'm, what I'm emphasizing is a focus on Louisiana though. You know, that's something that I'm going co to continue to make sure that the federal government is not overstepping their reach. And then secondly, some of the laws that the federal government is enacting do not infringe upon traditional Louisiana values. That's an incredibly important role and I'm gonna continue to do that. But I wanna focus on Louisiana. Okay, and we have so many problems here at home. We need to make sure that all of these offices are hyper-focused on helping our citizens on a day-to-day -day basis. So, and then secondly, how do I set myself apart? A couple different ways. Number one, you know, I'm a small business owner. I'm a, we run a small law firm in Crowley, Louisiana. We do everything that walks in the door. You know, and, and that is actually very frustrating at times. I would love to be able to specialize, but what it does is it has given me a background in almost every single area of law in this state, which I think lends itself incredibly well to the Attorney General's office. So, secondly, I've been in the legislature since 2017. I've handled just about every type of bill. I've handled, I've sat on numerous committees. I've seen the budgeting process. I've seen the ways and means process with taxes. You know, I've, I've carried civil bills, criminal bills. And so that experience being in the legislature, and then secondly, and then thirdly, the experience doing redistricting, which gave me a great expertise in, in both federal law, state law, traveling the state, all of these things uh, that have led me to this spot in this moment in my life, I think Lynn's has, has prepared me for that role. But then secondly, it, they, the, my talents and my background just lends itself incredibly well to that role. And, and it would be a tremendous honor to serve in, as Attorney General for the state of Louisiana. All right, John, well, I appreciate hearing your story and we'll be following your campaign very closely until Election Day on October 14th. So thanks for being here. Thanks so much. We'll be right back.
This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back. Looking ahead to the coming week, the third week of session continues. And on Monday, one of Stefanski's fentanyl bills will be debated at the legislature. And on Wednesday, House Education will be debating Raymond Cruz's bill regarding using preferred pronouns. The same day, Kyle Green's bill to repeal the death penalty will be getting its first hearing. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Politics. I'm Shannon Hecht, and I'll see you next Sunday here on your local election headquarters.